Guru Nation, welcome to episode 400, actually, of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. Also, a special episode of uh, the Clinical Trials Guru does your homework assignment, because today I got a question that it looks like somebody's homework assignment. Uh, but I'll do those if you send me your, if it's interesting, I'll usually do a podcast on it, because they're good questions. Uh, there's actually a lot of them here, so I'm going to go through it. Hopefully we learn something together about this. Hopefully this person gets an A plus on their homework. Maybe not. Maybe the teacher listens to the podcast and says you just basically put where, what Dan said uh, in your assignment. But uh, let's go through this, okay? So episode 400 is a good uh, podcast episode. So this is about SMOs, Site Management Organizations. And it's also about CROs, and it's about the industry uh, and the business models. So this looks like an interesting one. I actually haven't looked at the questions yet. So let's go through them right now. And uh, the first thing is about the SMO, uh, understanding the market map. So is there a typical way the SMO industry is defined? And let me just say, you've probably heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. SMOs used to be a very popular thing uh, in the mid-90s and up until maybe the early 2000s, right? SMOs fell out of favor somewhere around the middle 2000s. Maybe we can call it right around the Great Recession that we had in 07. They fell out of favor. They fell out of favor from pharma and CRO because they focus too much on scale and on enrolling subjects and not enough on quality. And the FDA audited some of the biggest SMOs on some pivotal studies and found that it was just a nightmare uh, as far as the quality of the data. So sponsors, as a response to this, now look at SMOs in a negative light. What replaced the SMO is actually the site network. And what, what really replaced SMO initially, like in 08, 09, 2010, was what's called a preferred site. So having a preferred site by a sponsor or being a preferred site by a CRO. I mean, that still exists. They A lot of sponsors and CROs have unofficial preferred sites. A lot of them have official preferred sites it, and it's exactly what it sounds like it's a site that the sponsor will give studies to uh, at least for a certain therapeutic indication or maybe even multiple therapeutic indications because that is a preferred site that site has worked with the sponsor they've sort of passed their audits sponsors do audits they've passed their audits and now they're they're labeling them preferred sites uh, what has evolved from the preferred sites is a site network. Site networks are really the new SMOs, but the business models are a little bit different. And by the way, just because the SMOs fell out of favor with pharma doesn't mean it's not a good business model anymore either. But what a lot of these site networks are doing are basically using, some of them are using the SMO business model and but calling it a site network. And the business model has changed a little bit, but not so much so. So let me talk about the different kind of site networks that are out there. I was just talking about the preferred sites that really started coming around right after the SMO, the demise of SMOs. So when the preferred sites came out, the way a site network evolved was two preferred sites, two or more preferred sites that were not related to each other formed an alliance, a strategic alliance. And so they would feed each other studies, but they still operate independently. And I've actually done a podcast on what a site network is and why pharma can benefit from having site networks because you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the scalability in a way of uh, the SMOs, but you get the quality from just a standalone site. Because that's what a site network actually is. It's an alliance of sites, but each of them are just a standalone clinic. So th this is important to keep in mind. Now, they can still share budgets. 
they can still share best practices, they can still share source docs, um, but they do each of them does their own work independently of the other. So they're an alliance in the sense that they'll help each other out, but they are still separate companies. So the problem, this goes back to some of these other questions, the problem with the SMO is that once the FDA audits one site from the SMO and they find problems, they're, they're likely going to find the same problems at the other sites from the SMO, maybe for the same study. And if the sponsor used the majority of their data from these SMOs for that particular study, the FDA is not going to allow that data because, I mean, the quality of, of data from these SMOs in the late 90s and early 2000s was, was terrible, terrible, to the point where this is like a, almost a bad word in, in the industry right now, SMO. So it's become site networks now, and site networks have evolved from the SMO. They still share some of the same business model. Matter of fact, there are some, some site networks that actually own each of the sites within their network. So that is basically like an SMO, it's just not called an SMO. DSC a site network, we have sites that we own within our network, but we also have sites in our network that pay into the network a small monthly fee to get access to studies, get access to our resources to do their budgets, source docs, SOPs, trainings. There's a lot of things that we can scale but each of the majority of the sites in our site network are independently owned and operated. So if the FDA came in and audited one of those sites and found a problem, that's a standalone site. It's not part of an SMO. And the FDA doesn't really know, nor do they necessarily care about site networks because site networks are informal. There's no record of the site network in the SOPs or anything. So it's a little bit different. Uh, that's how the SMO industry was segmented. Uh, what are the sub-industries? This is another question. What are the sub-industries I should be thinking about within the SMO industry? So from now on, every time you say SMO, I'm going to say site network because that's the new SMO. So the sub-industries for this is the actual site, all right? The experience research site, and then even one level below that is the inexperienced research site, so the private practice physician that hasn't done research yet because that's a potential member, a potential future member of the site network. So growth, how big is the current market for site networks today? So the current market for site networks, this is a relatively new thing and uh, there is a demand from pharma because pharma wants, when, when a sponsor has a feasibility survey for a new study, they need fast responses so that they can quickly select which sites would be appropriate. So there is a lot of value in having a site network because that pr that provides scalability to the sponsors. There's also value in the study startup phase. So because site networks often share the same budgets, they each negotiate their own budget and contract because they're separate companies. So that's one of the main differences between a site network and an SMO. In the SMO, they basically shared one contract and so the SMO negotiated one budget with the pharma company and that was the budget everyone would get. With the site network we can share amongst ourselves what we're each getting so we have uh, the ability and, and knowledge of how to negotiate but still each one is negotiating independently because remember they're independent um, entity in the site network. So the current market for the site network is growing because the pharma wants to head in the direction of scalability, but they don't want to they don't want that to come at the expense of quality, which uh, the SMOs, you know, went crazy with. They said we don't really care about quality. We're going to find all these research naive physicians with good patient databases. We're going to bring them studies, we're going to enroll, and then we're going to kind of move on because it's easier to go find a new doctor and just repeat this model and sort of leave this this research naive physician holding the bag and that's what happened and that's why a lot of these SMOs from the mid 90s and early 2000s actually 
pissed off a lot of doctors and there's a reason why I think there are a big reason why so many doctors still have a, a bad experience with research it was because of these fast moving SMOs that didn't really pay attention to quality and I think with the site networks it's very different especially with a site network like DSCS I mean we really this is why we have the site owner academy the CRC academy the CRA Academy, the PI Academy, which is brand new that we're about to launch. It's we're really training these doctors. So we're empowering them and we're not taking any of their profits. We're just taking a monthly retainer fee. It's like right now it's twelve hundred bucks a month. So that's what we charge. There's no other fee. We're not getting we don't we have no incentive for the site to screen like crazy and then not care about quality. We just want them to get the study. We want them to keep all the profits so that they have the incentive to learn how to run their clinic. And they can run it however they want. We're just here to help. That's the difference really between the site network and the SMO. The site networks of today, the ones that are well run, and because there are site networks that are run still like SMOs, unfortunately, but most of them are not. Most of them have this quality approach because that's the way you can survive in this industry long term. So that's a key driver. That's number two. That's one of the key drivers. Uh, number three, are you seeing a trend where pharma companies are spending more on uh, site networks year over year? Um, yes, because the site networks are growing, pharma is going to be spending more on these site networks. First of all, there's more studies. Second of all, we need more sites and then pharma doesn't have time to train these sites that are research naive so they really depend on these site networks to do the heavy lifting for them this is why my site networks growing because well part of it has to do with the podcast a lot of it has to do with this podcast but a lot of it has to do with with the network effect the bigger we get the more sites in our network the more leverage we have for pharma and then the more we can reinvest back into our training and our resources so we can train these sites how to do research and then as long as they're successful they're gonna continue to remain a client of ours in our site network because our monthly fee is not expensive um, number four are you seeing more pharma or drug developers using site networks for the first time yes because it's relatively new so you know anything that's new by definition is going to be used by the first time by somebody but I I think site networks have now been around for at least I think preferred site networks I mean site networks have always been around even in the days of the SMOs alliances were always here but I think this is like a new trend now and I would say since 2015 and beyond we're seeing a lot of site network a lot of site network growth not so much SMO but site networks. Now, here's the interesting thing. Here's the thing that's going to confuse you. Because I just spoke, I just spent the last 15 minutes talking about how SMOs is like a bad word. Um, I do think history repeats itself. I do think that site networks are going to gain so much steam and so much popularity that it's going to be really easy for one of these site networks to go back to the SMO model. So, Instead of having a loose alliance, maybe because they're so successful, all the all the sites in the alliance are so successful that all the owners talk about merging. And now it's one big, if you want to call it an SMO, or you can just call it multiple sites under the same umbrella. I mean, it's basically the same thing. So I do think that SMOs are going to make a comeback, but only amongst the highest quality uh, sites and it wouldn't make sense for someone like DSCS because we have we, we go by volume of sites because we're only charging a monthly retainer fee we don't take any profits from the sites that we don't own we do own a lot of the sites we own like five of the sites in our site network but our site network right now as of June 2020 is around 50 sites and we own maybe five of them so 45 are not we don't own and we have no intention of owning we want those sites to do well because we're going for 200 sites in our site network but I do think some alliances of like five sites all get together and say hey let's make ju let's just merge into a mega company and uh, just to make sharing profits easier 
Um, so I do think the SMOs are going to make a comeback, but not to the extent that we saw in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, I think site networks are taking the place of that. But I do think, interestingly enough, SMOs might make a comeback for that reason. Um, so let's see. Let's go through some of these other ones. How many customers do you think the industry serves versus how many could it serve? Look, we need more patients in studies. That's the bottom line. So here's the problem with research sites. Usually they start out as a, a private practice doctor that wants to do research, okay, to bring in a new revenue stream. Now that doctor does research, let's say for five years, seven years, now they're doing so good in research, this happens all the time, they end up doing so good with research that they don't even want to do the private practice anymore. They want to spend all their time. I mean, some of our most successful clients in our site networks did this. They started out private practice. Now they're full-time research. The, the, the problem with this is you're eventually going to run out of patients if you don't service the private practice because that's what feeds the research. So the more physicians that go this route the more we're just going to need more research naive physicians to take their place. We need the research naive physicians because they have their own private practice and they're actually treating these patients so this is where the patients are going to come from and doctors are more likely to enroll their own patients in studies if it's their own study as opposed to referring them to someone else. Uh, it's just the way they are. Doctors pretty much are control freaks and they want their patients I mean and and they should because that's their patients they're in charge of their safety and well-being so I understand that so I do think that the white space is the research naive physicians because we're constantly going to need more patients and the only way to get more patients because every year there's more studies is getting new physicians who see their own patients doing research um, how many, so some of these questions don't make sense and I already answered them. Uh, how is the decision to use an SMO or a site network and which site network to use uh, with a drug developer? So it's a numbers game. They need, th sponsors care about two things really. They care about how quickly can you enroll patients, how quickly can you get started, and then the quality of your work. As long as you your quality is no worse than mediocre, you're going to keep getting repeat business as long as you're enrolling patients and you can quickly start up. Now if the quality of your of your data is horrible, they're not going to use you again. But as long as it's mediocre, it doesn't have to be great quality. Just average. But if you're enrolling patients, you're going to keep coming back. So that's the decision that the sponsors use. Also, like I said, scalability, having the ability to get 50, for example, a sponsor that works with our site network, if you want 50 feasibility surveys within a week for a study, you're going to get that. And uh, 50, getting 50 feasibility surveys one-on-one -on -one without a site network is going to be a slower process. Um, is there increased use of site networks by pharma companies? Yes, and uh, what's driving that is what I just said, the need for more patients in studies. And what percentage of sites are in a site network? See, I think this is where the opportunity is. I think most sites, maybe 95%, are not part of a site network or an SMO. They're just standalone. And I do think there is an opportunity here. I also think one of the things we haven't talked about academic medical centers yet one of the things I'm seeing with academic medical centers, because I'm also a consultant, so I monitor at an, at an AMC, an academic medical center, and I also am a consultant, so I help uh, different hospitals and AMCs set up their private off-site locations. I'm seeing a lot of the AMCs wanting to create their own small, smaller, private uh, sometimes it's nonprofit, but private clinics so that they can get some of the studies that they can't do because of their local IRBs at the AMC. They can do them 
in a, in a private way with central IRBs. So I'm even seeing like this is sort of an alliance or a site network for AMCs. Uh, so that that's an interesting thing. But I do think that this is an opportunity here for 95% of the sites out there. Uh, so what does the business relationship look like between a pharma company and a site network? Very simple. Pharma company creates the protocol. The investigators are hired to enroll patients and collect the data and pass an FDA audit if need be, or at least the sponsor audit. Um, so that's that's the business relationship. The sites get paid not in grants. A lot of people who are new to research think that sites get paid in grants because that's what universities do. Sites get paid based on enrolling patients. So if you if you have a study and you're a site and you don't enroll patients, you're not earning revenue. So the sponsors pay based on enrollment uh, almost in real time. I mean they're like one to three months behind but they pay based on enrollment. And what are the SMO or what are the site network major costs to provide their service? It's overhead, okay? It's regulatory, it's training the staff, which is kind of time consuming, retaining the staff, finding new staff. It's really just salaries for the researchers, the PIs, the coordinators, the sub buys, all that kind of stuff. It's mostly overhead and, and employee costs. Typical industry margins for a research site are usually 50% and up. Okay, usually the smaller the site, the higher the profit margin. So let's just say theoretically the smallest site can just be one person and that's a principal investigator who also serves as the coordinator. That person's going to be running a roughly 100% profit margins assuming that the physician's private practice is paying the rent and all the bills. Now most of the time you're going to be anywhere between 50 and 90 based on the overhead that you have. So the bigger the site gets, usually the closer to 50, sometimes even 40, 30 if it's not well managed are the margins, profit margins, but that is the uh, net profit, right? The, the gross profit margins after all expenses, so like the EBITDA. And um, these things are important when you're looking to acquire or sell uh, a site. So now a little bit about the CRO because the CRO is completely different from an SMO. A CRO has nothing to do with enrolling patients. A CRO has to do with selecting the sites and then monitoring the data, monitoring the activity of the data and solving problems. So they work, they're like the middleman between the sponsor and the site. And again, they should not be confused with an SMO because an SMO basically is just a bunch of sites or a site network. It's just a bunch of sites. In that case, that's an alliance of sites. Uh, an easy way to tell the difference between a CRO and a site network or an SMO or a site is for every study, there's usually only one CRO. Sometimes there's no CRO. The sponsor could monitor their own study and serve the role of a CRO. So there's usually only one CRO in a study, but there may be multiple, like dozens, sometimes even hundreds of sites for that same study. So the CRO is in charge of the monitoring, the monitoring plan, making sure that the data is being collected and reported as per GCP and FDA standards. This is where the whole monitoring thing comes in. Sometimes the CROs even help the sponsor create the protocol. Sometimes they help them report the results to the FDA. Sites don't do any of that. Sites see the patients, they watch out for the safety of the patients, and they collect the data. The CRO kind of takes it from there and, and helps the sponsor out. Uh, the market for CROs is big. Interestingly enough, I think sponsors are trying to find ways to be more involved. So this is something good to put in your paper for your homework assignment. In 2016, GCP had its uh, revisions. So just Google GCP 2016 revisions. The FDA said sponsors are solely responsible for the conduct of their study. 
even if they're using an, a, a CRO. So now what you're seeing is sponsors reviewing every single monitoring report. Sponsors reviewing the CV of every single CRA, even if they're employees of the CRO. So the sponsors are saying to themselves, well, if we're, if we're doing all this anyways, why are we using the CRO? So now the CROs are trying to reinvent themselves. This is why they're pushing for virtual trials. This is why they're trying all these other things to get like preferred sites and get these site networks because they're trying to find their core competency. Their core competency has been basically running the entire study for the sponsor. Well, now the FDA said you can still use a CRO but you have to run the study more or less. You have to be involved and know what's going on. So the CROs are reinventing themselves. Um, the big ones, Ikevia, PPD, Cineos, those are the big ones. I don't think they're going away anytime soon, but their roles are going to change over the next few decades um, in different ways. I think virtual trials and technology is going to have a lot to do with it. I do think CROs are becoming more technology companies, uh, which they should be. And so how big is the current market for CROs? I'm going to let you Google that because I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's huge. Uh, are you seeing more pharma or drug developers using CROs for the first time? No. CROs have been around since the 1970s. I want to say Dennis Geelings from Quintiles created the first CRO ever. And uh, when he was a researcher at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and since then, basically, I mean, he came up with the idea of, hey, let me help, let me create this thing called a CRO that helps sponsors manage their studies better. So the 80s and 90s and 2000s and 2010s and even 2020 is big for CROs. So I doubt any sponsors are using a CRO for the first time unless it's their first study. Um, so the market growth is still there. But again, it's going to shift because technology is going to be a disruptor. And if this virtual trials thing takes off, we have to see which CRO has those capabilities. They're all trying to do it. They're all trying to get to be the main player in virtual trials, which remains to be seen. That's another podcast in and of itself. Uh, so that that's it. I mean, there's more questions, but I think we answered most of it. And uh, hopefully this helps not only you get an A plus on your paper, uh, and let me know what grade you got, but somebody else out there probably also is going to benefit from this video because sometimes these things are confusing. Even for me working in the industry, it's confusing. So, uh, and this is a dynamic situation that's changing every year. So keep in touch. Thank you for listening to episode 400, and talk to you soon. Bye bye.